So, uh, <clears throat> good, good morning to all of you. And just going to make a, about two minutes of remarks uh, before uh, Mr. Prince and Ms. Hinker and uh, Mia come up here. But let me just start with a comment, and that is that really impressed and grateful for the the terrific work you've done as an, uh, as an audience the last few meetings. These have been like really scholarly and challenging and interesting meetings. I found them fascinating. And, and even though I know that people are, there's a lot of sickness and fatigue on the campus, you guys have been fantastic. I think respectful <coughs> and attentive and, and uh, exactly what we want to be. And you know, always remember that when an outsider comes to Taft, this is their impression of the school, right? This moment in here and this gathering and all that you are, uh, says a lot about us. So I'm really, really grateful and, and respectful for it. So let me, here's what I want to, uh, like to think about about with this week, you know, the next few days um, as we celebrate Martin Luther King. What I like to think is that it's, it's what we always do, but even more. It's who we are, but even better. And, and this is what I mean. You might think of being a Taft student as about expanding things. That is, your years here are about expanding your capacities and your skills and your understanding, your passion, your resilience, and all kinds of things. I, I like to think at the end of the day, it's a, it really is about expanding your heart and about expanding your mind. And as teachers, we work really hard, and the faculty in this, uh, this school try to create the circumstances where you get that kind of expansion. They work, faculty work really hard to create an experience in and out of the classroom that expands your mind and heart. They live for this, they devote their lives to it, and they find deep meaning in it. And I would argue that it's hard to find many hours we spend during the year really more potent for this kind of expansion than these hours around MLK Day. And I mean, and I think about this, I mean the talk about the civil political discourse we had on Tuesday, Dr. Petrella's remarkable address yesterday, today's school meeting, the sights and sounds of, of Saturday's World Fest, the stories that, are, that you can see in, those mo in the movies on Sunday, the reflections of the prayer breakfast, the learning around case studies, the sharing at discussion tables, the electricity in Bingham. There's a chance for you to expand your heart and mind in the next five days that is amazing. Again, it's what we always do, but I think even more so. And the best thing is it is free and it is available for everyone. So my counsel to you would be seize this, right? Take these opportunities over the next few days. You want to be better prepared to succeed and lead here and in college and in life wherever you go? Well, then don't miss the opportunity that you have here. I would say that for every day, obviously, but in particularly the next few days. Don't sit on the sidelines. Don't sit idle in indifference. Get engaged and bring an open heart, bring an open mind. It is for every one of you, and just like any dorm or team or club or class, we need everyone, right? We need engagement from each of you. So you'll get to wrestle with interesting and challenging ideas, right? Including ones that are hard to wrap your brain around. That's the mind expansion piece, right? That's the intellectual expansion can happen. It is an intellectual exercise. It is a workout that can leave your mind like a muscle expanded, stronger and more elastic and more capable. It is hard, this exercise, and it's supposed to be. I spoke with a boy in the weight room last night, and we, we stumbled into a metaphor that will make sense to you. What did you think of the speaker today, I asked, and he was on the bench press, working hard. Mr. Mack, it was really tough. Some of it went over my head. But I learned things I'd never thought of. For instance, uh, things about Susan B. Anthony and the white suffragettes, it was really challenging. Like, it was really hard to figure out. As you can imagine, I said, yeah, it was heavy lifting, wasn't it? <laughs> Give me credit. <clears throat> oh, wow, thank you. Wow, I'm being, I'm being damned by faint praise there. But, but that's the point, obviously, is that the work we do all the time is an intellectual exercise, and if you think of the mind as a muscle, it gets stronger. You'll get to experience moments that have deep emotional power. That's the heart expansion piece. Moments where you might feel intense feelings, maybe some mix, and I know I will feel this, of joy and exhaustion and belonging and confusion and sadness and longing and pride, and that will expand your heart and leave it warmer and more capacious and more robust, more capable of empathic connection, more able to accept and trust, forgive and love. So all you have to do to be expanded in those two ways is to bring your best self. You need to be willing to participate willingly, listen openly, discuss civilly, learn eagerly. Each of you can do this. I know you can. It's what we ask every day just more so. 
So remember that in the beginning of the year, I argued that what, I don't know if you'll remember this in that opening, I said, what makes great organizations is that they have these really high standards and everyone in the place is able to uphold them, right? That's what makes these great organizations. And the fact that that's the case meant that we all belonged, that there were no outsiders. You came here to Taft essentially and said, you know what, I, I want to be part of those high standards of conduct and scholarship and citizenship. And when you said that, you got this card that just was stamped Tafty, and it said, you belong, right? Every one of you belonged. And that's the kind of place I'd like this to be. It's the kind of place that is fun and healthy and safe to grow, to take risks, to learn, to be your whole self, or as Horace Taft said in 1918 in that handbook, to be genuine. So I just hope that you meet these high standards in the next few days. I'm going to work hard to bring my best self. I know you will too. I am predicting this. I'm predicting that each of you is going to leave my own mind and my own heart expanded. I can't wait for that feeling and for it. I thank you in advance. And I just end with that thought that can you imagine the feel of a community if everyone, if every one of us felt that our hearts and our minds had been expanded by the actions and thoughts of others, if everybody looked to their left and right and said, that person next to me expanded my heart, expanded my mind, that would be truly special. So that's the spirit I go into the next few days. And with that, and with great thanks um, for Mr. Prince and Ms. Hinker and Mia, I'll turn it over to them. So many thanks. Good morning, all. I'm Mr. Prince. Hi, I'm Mrs. Sinker. Uh, and we're here today uh, to give you a sample uh, case study, an example of the kind of work that we're going to be doing uh, as groups on Monday. Uh, and the case study that we have prepared for you is one uh, about race, gender, and politics through the lens of Anita Hill and uh, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas. All right. So why are we here? Well, we're here to talk about this particular case through the lens of intersectionality, um, not just thinking about it through gender or race, but both in the intersection of both. So just a reminder, intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender regarded as creating overlapping and independent, uh, interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Etc. You can read that. I don't have to read that for you. Sorry. Um, d just a quick uh, test of the waters here. Raise your hand if you are familiar with Anita, Hay Anita Hill or Clarence Thomas. Do you, anyone remember that case? Okay. All right, a few of you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, just to put it in context for myself, uh, uh, when this happened in the summer of 1991, I was actually between my freshman and sophomore year in high school, so I was your age up here, and I... Um, it was powerful for me. I remember. I have vivid memories of it, actually. And what I remember specifically is um, there was a lot of talk about the very salacious details, and I think that's a piece of what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, so, more about the case. Yeah, just uh, to echo what Ms. Hinker said, we are going to be talking a little bit about uh, violence, about racially based violence and uh, sexual assault and violence. So, uh, warn you of that in advance. Uh, so the facts of the case. Uh, in 1991, uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, the first black American uh, to serve as a Supreme Court justice, was set to retire. Uh, uh, George Bush Sr., George H.W. Bush, uh, nominated then federal judge uh, Clarence Thomas uh, to be his replacement. And it's important to note that Clarence Thomas is, of course, a black man. Um, so uh, when we're uh, appointing Supreme Court uh, justices, they are nominated uh, by the President and then confirmed by the Senate. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee had held hearings, um, had decided to push uh, just Judge Thomas forward uh, to a full vote of the Senate, but before that could happen, uh, allegations surfaced, uh, allegations of uh, sexual assault uh, made by uh, Miss Anita Hill, uh, who had worked uh, as, uh, with uh, Clarence Thomas and with Clarence Thomas as her supervisor at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, before a full vote would be taken uh, on whether or not to uh, confirm uh, Judge Thomas, um, they decided to have hearings uh, where both Ms. Hill uh, and uh, Judge Thomas would speak. We're not going to share all the hearings with you, but we did want to give you uh, a sample of the opening statements of both uh, Ms. Hill and Judge Thomas. So uh, here they are. During this period at the Department of Education, my working relationship with Judge Thomas was positive. I had a good deal of responsibility and independence. I thought he respected my work and that he trusted my judgment. After approximately three months of working there, he asked me to go out socially with him. What happened next 
and telling the world about it are the two most difficult things, experiences of my life. It is only after a great deal of agonizing consideration and sleepless number, great number of sleepless nights that I am able to talk of these unpleasant matters to anyone but my close friends. I declined the invitation to go out socially with him and explained to him that I thought it would jeopardize at what at, at the time I considered to be a very good working relationship. I had a normal social life with other men outside of the office. I believed then, as now, that having a social relationship with a person who was supervising my work would be ill-advised. I was very uncomfortable with the idea and told him so. I thought that by saying no and explaining my reasons, my employer would abandon his social suggestions. However, to my regret, in the following few weeks, he continued to ask me out on several occasions. He pressed me to justify my reasons for saying no to him. These incidents took place in his office or mine. They were in the form of private conversations, which not, would not have been overheard by anyone else. My working relationship became even more strained when Judge Thomas began to use work situations to discuss sex. On these occasions, he would call me into his office for reports on education issues and projects, or he might suggest that because of the time pressures of his schedule, we go to lunch to a government cafeteria. After a brief discussion of work, he would turn the conversation to a discussion of sexual matters. His conversations were very vivid. He spoke about acts that he had seen in pornographic films involving such matters as women having sex with animals and films showing group sex or rape scenes. He talked about pornographic materials depicting individuals with large penises or large breasts involved in various sex acts. On several occasions, Thomas told me graphically of his own sexual prowess. Because I was extremely uncomfortable talking about sex with him at all, and particularly in such a graphic way, I told him that I did not want to talk about these subjects. And now the, uh, an excerpt of the opening statement from Judge uh, Clarence Thomas. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, Senator Thurman, members of the committee. As excruciatingly difficult as the last two weeks have been, I welcome the opportunity to clear my name today. No one other than my wife and Senator Danforth to whom I read this statement at 6.30 a.m. has seen or heard the statement. No handlers, no advisors. The first I learned of the allegations by Professor Anita Hill was on September 25, 1991, when the FBI came to my home to investigate her allegations. When informed by the FBI agent of the nature of the allegations and the person making them, I was shocked, surprised, hurt, and enormously saddened. I have not been the same since that day. For almost a decade, my responsibilities included enforcing the rights of victims of sexual harassment. As a boss, as a friend, and as a human being, I was proud that I had never had such an allegation leveled against me, even as I sought to promote women and minorities into non-traditional jobs. In addition, 
Several of my friends who are women have confided in me about the horror of harassment on the job or elsewhere. I thought I really understood the anguish, the fears, the doubts, the seriousness of the matter. But since September 25th, I have suffered immensely as these very serious charges were leveled against me. I have been racking my brains and eating my insides out, trying to think of what I could have said or done to Anita Hill to lead her to allege that I was interested in her in more than a professional way and that I talked with her about pornographic or X-rated films. Contrary to some press reports, I categorically denied all of the allegations and denied that I ever attempted to date Anita Hill when first interviewed by the FBI. I strongly reaffirm that denial. Let so obviously hearings like this are really complex as we just saw with Judge Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. You know, there's a bunch of different reasons for that. Number one, you know, it can boil down to a he said, she said sort of situation. Also, are accusations like this um, worth considering whether or not a Supreme uh, Court judge is worthy of being on the bench. So, you know, maybe this isn't a big deal, big enough deal, et cetera, but, but it is complex. Um, making it more complex is that both gender and race were in, in the conversation here. Both feminists who were predominantly white and anti-racists who were predominantly black men um, were heavily involved in the public discourse. And we're going to talk about how both of those angles sort of missed the mark a little bit about what was really um, complicating this particular case. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the perspective of black, primarily black anti-racists and some of what was missed uh, there. Uh, so I think it's worth uh, reiterating that Clarence Thomas, uh, a black man, was uh, nominated to replace the only uh, black American who had served on the Supreme uh, Court. Uh, it's also worth noting uh, that Justice uh, Marshall and uh, then Judge Thomas had drastically different understandings of the law and the Constitution in particular. Uh, Justice Marshall uh, was a liberal, uh, was a, uh, a judicial activist, meaning he thought we should read beyond the text uh, of the Constitution to infer deeper meanings. Um, he generally supported uh, affirmative action uh, and a woman's right to have uh, an abortion. Uh, then Judge uh, Thomas uh, was and still is a conservative. Uh, he is a strict uh, constructionist. Uh, believing that we should read the text of the Constitution that is, as, as it is and infer no more. Uh, he opposed affirmative action as inappropriate social engineering uh, and generally thought that Roe versus Wade had been decided incorrectly. Moreover, uh, Clarence Thomas's positions were largely uh, in opposition to black American political positions at the time. Uh, again, Judge Thomas was conservative uh, and with some strong uh, libertarian streaks. Uh, and at most, 20% of black Americans could have considered themselves conservatives at the time, even fewer libertarians. Uh, however, uh, Judge Thomas found the, prim the majority of his support uh, from black Americans. I think anywhere from 55% to 63%, depending on the public opinion poll that you looked at. Um, and I think in considering that, you have to take into account the idea that racial solidarity was important. Uh, the idea that a black American would be replacing the only other black American to have served on the Supreme Court was appealing to folks. Um, and I think it's even more telling uh, that support for Judge Thomas increased after these hearings. Uh, and I think we have to ask ourselves why, and it's at least in part because these hearings harken back to uh, the way that race and racial oppression and violence had played out in American history. So I'm going to play you an excerpt uh, from uh, Judge Thomas uh, 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 that details his opinion about the role of race uh, in, these, in these hearings. And from my standpoint, as a black American, as far as I'm concerned, it is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves to do for themselves, to have different ideas. And it is a message 
that unless you kowtow to an old order, this is what will happen to you. You will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured by a committee of the US, US Senate rather than hung from a tree. He characterizes the high-tech lynching. Uh, that is powerful language uh, rooted in the deep history of racial violence and oppression in America. Um, the Equal Justice Institute calculated or documented some 4,084 lynchings uh, of black Americans that took place between the end of Reconstruction in 1877 and 1950. Uh, in fact, there's been a, a memorial uh, created in Montgomery, Alabama, the National Center uh, for Peace and Justice, uh, where if you go, there are some 800 steel columns or, or beams that hang from the roof, uh, meant to symbolize the black bodies. Uh, that were beaten and hung and tortured. And in each of those beams, you can see a county and, on that, and, the, and then the, the folks that were lynched within that county. Um, these lynchings were, were brutal. Uh, not that hanging isn't bad enough, but they weren't just hangings. I won't share the details, but you should read about it. They were public. Uh, I'll speak for myself. Uh, when I used to think of lynchings, I thought that they happened in the backwoods, uh, something shameful and to be hidden away. But no, these were public events. Towns would stop what they were doing for the day to attend a lynching. So much so that the photos of lynchings, and yes, there are photos of lynchings, would be put on postcards to be sent to people. And you can find those anywhere on the internet. There's, there's some great archives. Um, so that's, you know, that, that is kind of the broader level historical backdrop. We can go a step deeper. Uh, Ida, Ida B. Wells, one of the, uh, the black feminists that uh, Dr. Petrella spoke about yesterday, uh, wrote this book called The Red Record. Uh, and in that, she documented lynchings between the years of 1892 and 1893. Uh, in those two years, of the 319 lynchings that took place, 109 of them, just about a third, or maybe fully a third, uh, were due to uh, accusations of rape, uh, alleged rape, suspected rape, and attempted rape. Uh, and if that's not impactful in and of itself, let's consider the categories. Rape, alleged rape, suspected rape, and, att uh, attempt and attempted rape. Uh, and that's because uh, oftentimes these black men would not make it to trial. They would be taken up by mobs and lynched before they ever had their due process. And we can ask questions about the validity, validity of these claims that we'll never have the answer to, but uh, th there is something there. And a lot of this has to do with the hypersexualization of black men, which is an Amer a, a singularly American uh, phenomenon, this idea that black men are obsessed with sex, and particularly with having sex with white women, and that white womanhood uh, is the zenith of American purity, and particularly American Southern purity. Uh, and this runs throughout American history and American culture. Uh, in D.W. Griffith's Birth of the Nation, the first full-length major motion picture, uh, black men were continually portrayed as lusting after white women, and white women were so afraid that they threw themselves off cliffs, uh, uh, committed suicide to avoid black men. Uh, we heard from Dr. Petrella yesterday, Rebecca Lattimore Felton, the first uh, female senator, said, if it needs lynching to protect woman's dearest possession from the ravening human beasts, then I say lynch a thousand a week if necessary. Emmett Till, uh, a 14-year-old black boy, uh, was lynched in Money, Mississippi uh, for whistling at a white woman, for whistling at a white woman. Uh, more recently, Maine Governor Paul LePage lamented black men coming to his state to sell drugs and then, quote, half the time they impregnate a young white girl. And Dylan Ruth, the author, the author of the massacre uh, in, the, uh, in Charleston, uh, said, I have to do this because you are raping our women and taking over the world. So when, Justice, when Judge Thomas, excuse me, uh, invoked this idea of a high-tech lynching, he invoked this long history uh, that was familiar to black Americans at the time uh, and, and got a response, a resounding response of support. Now, uh, there were things missed with that lens, and it's important to highlight that, and that's primarily why we're here. Um, Anita Hill, lest we forget, is black, and that was forgotten by many at the time, and I think that's telling. Again, Dr. Petrella talked about it yesterday. The erasure, uh, the, the, the fact of erasure of black women from history is real. Rosa Parks being spirited away from the March on Washington because she was giving too many interviews is real. Uh, I challenge you, think about this, name a black uh, uh, woman activist in the women's suffrage movement, other than Rosa Parks and perhaps Diane Nash in the civil rights movement in the second wave feminist movement, in the gay rights movement. And I think it'd probably be difficult to do. 
Right? So again, if that's that one level of erasure, we have to go a level deeper because black women also suffer at uh, abnormally high rates from sexual assault, sexual harassment, and sexual violence. Uh, we can go back in history, black women, uh, black female slaves were raped by their slave masters without repercussion. There's a long history of white assailants uh, who were not punished for raping black women because the, the death penalty was too stringent, was thought to be too stringent. 40% of black American girls uh, report sexual assault by the age of 18, that's today. 40% of black American women are victims of intimate partner violence, that's today. And those numbers are disproportionately high. All of that, all of that history and how it applied to Nita Hill was lost by looking at just race and not considering the intersections of race and gender. So when I was researching sort of feminist support of Anita Hill, I found plenty of it. Um, but unfortunately, race was lost in the feminist support. And so um, Andrew just, or Mr. Prince just talked a little bit about how, you know the importance of that. Uh, this is an example of a, an advertisement of a Democratic Senate candidate in 1982, the year after the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings. I'm just going to show you a brief clip of it because the very start of it. Um, she mentions it. October 11th. Did you conclude that Judge Thomas was guilty of sexual harassment? Did this make you as angry as it made me? I'm Lynn Yackel, and it's time we do something about the mess in Washington. So, um, I'll take that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the importance of that is that we had a lot of women saying, you know, this is a problem, this makes us angry, but they weren't really talking about, you know, the racial aspect of it um, uh, explicitly. You'll see here, Anita Hill is with Gloria Steinem, who is, you know, a very prominent white female uh, figure, feminist in, in the modern era. And, you know, there's a, um, the writer of this uh, article, Deborah Sontag, is a, a white um, journalist. Um, it, this, this article is from the New York Times in April of 1992. And the title of it, you know, it credits Anita Hill with revitalizing feminism, which is wonderful. Irene um, Natividad, I'm sorry about the pronunciation, that she's actually Filipino. She is a chairwoman of the National Commission of Working Women. She said what Anita Hill has done is to make sexual harassment the great connector among women, which is wonderful. The president of New York uh, Women's Foundation, Marianne Kaplan, who's white, said, Professor Hill has become a symbol of a new and potent wave of feminism. And in this picture, um, Hill is seen with Gloria Steinem, a leader of the feminist movement in the modern era. And at the Hunter, at Hunter College Conference, where they are here, Gloria Steinem credited Hill with corralling our anger um, and imagined a scenario in which Professor Hill would eventually sit on the Supreme Court herself. Um, and, you know, feminists understood that this was an important moment. We were asking about, you know, treatment of women and if that should matter with men, you know, in, in positions of power, especially making laws that would affect women. And we see, just as the speaker yesterday says that, you know, history rhymes, we see that, you know, we've had this happen twice now where Supreme Court justice has accusations of sexual harassment brought against them. And we have two covers here. Um, what was missed in the centering of gender uh, and, and the sort of the minimization of race is the fact that the voices that were lost, that were not included, were those of black women who have a very particular experience with their own characterization of their sexuality, which, stemmed, which started in slavery, continued through Jim Crow, that affects the way Anita Hill was treated and was believed or not believed. More people believed Dr. Um, Christine Blasey Ford then believed Anita Hill, and you saw Anita Hill in that hearing, and she, in my opinion, was quite credible. So we'll just talk. Um, I guess the point is, I had to ask myself, what could have, what could white feminists have done differently in order to support Anita Hill better? And the answer that I came to is turn the mic over to black women. And so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to introduce uh, Mia Porter, who is going, who is a favorite of mine um, and a leader here on camp campus. And she's going to actually introduce us to some black um, female feminists that we should know about that we should listen to and that we should um, ask for their opinion and, and bring into the conversation the next time something like this happens. So Mia, come on up. Thank you. Um, so although black feminism may be a new concept to some of you, 
Um, black feminists have been around for centuries and are, are currently on the rise. Um, with women like Anna Julia Cooper, who was the fourth black woman to earn a PhD, um, leading the way for literature um, for black women. Black feminists came about like Zora Neale Hurston, Audre Lorde, Toni Morrison, and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who have um, taken on black feminism through the form of representation in literature, often speaking of sexual harassment, um, the disparities between black women and black men that are often not discussed. Um, activists such as Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, um, Amy Jacques Garvey, which is the wife of Marcus Garvey, who the speaker referenced um, yesterday, who was often left out of the equation, Rosa Parks, Angela Davis, Tarana Burke, who was the original founder of the Me Too movement, um, which is now on the rise um, lately, but was started in 2007. Alicia Garza, Patrice Coolers, Opal Tometi um, have all used their voices to raise political awareness of the struggles of intersectionality. Um, Alicia Garza, Patrice Coolers, and Opal Tometi are the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, they state, as a network, we have always recognized the need to center the leadership of women in queer and trans people to maximize our movement muscle and to be intentional about not replicating harmful practices that excluded so many in past movements for liberation, we made a commitment to placing those at the margins closer to the center. In terms of pop culture, we have amazing women like Billie Holiday, Aretha Franklin, Lauren Hill, India Ari, Beyonce, Rihanna, Yara Shahidi, and many more spreading awareness through music and social media influence. Although I didn't name all of the black feminists, um, these are women that I have named um, our most prominent figures in my life um, and are a source of inspiration and have major influence over the awareness of intersectionality today. So uh, that uh, is an example of the kind of case study uh, that you might take up on Monday, and I know you all have signed up for your case studies. Um, after that, on Monday, uh, you will have an opportunity to discuss these case studies with uh, your peers uh, as well as a couple faculty members. Um, for those case study discussions, uh, we will use discussion norms that I hope are beginning to come, become familiar. I put them up on the screen. Uh, I won't read them to you because you'll see them again, but just an introduction. Uh, and then you'll have the opportunity to discuss some really important questions. So uh, some examples of some questions you might, uh, you might consider. Uh, what struck you about this case? What stood out? Um, How would you summarize the problems of single identifier lenses? How might an intersectional lens have changed the public discourse around this case? What other intersections of identities were relevant to this case? And how do you see the intersections of these identities affecting your life at Taft, or at home, or in the future? Uh, I thank you, we thank you for your time uh, and your attention, and more importantly, your continued work and engagement. I just want to echo some words from Mr. Mack, please engage. If you're unsure, if you're unclear, if you disagree, please don't sit on the sidelines, get involved. We need to talk, we need to discuss. Thank you very much, you are dismissed.